Welcome to our sixth lecture on solar electric energy systems. Today we will talk about non-electrical issues, basically mounting, but also other BOS, that means balance of system costs. We also will discuss off versus on-grid systems and costs in general. If we take a look at the cost structure of our PV power plant, we can see the following. We have a large part which consists of the semiconductor materials and the processing like solar cell technology modules and so on. But also we have a very big part that consists of non-electrical issues that is installation, support structure, ground preparation and so on. This amount up to 35%. If we take a look at the price development of a relatively small scale PV system from 10 to 100 kilowatt in Germany, we see that about 14 years ago, 2006, the main costs have been the module amounting 71% and the BOS costs, including the inverter, only amounted 29%. If we take a look at 2018, we see that only 45% of the total costs are due to the module costs and the majority, 55%, is due to the balance of system costs, including inverter. Let's take a look at the mounting. So what is important for the mounting? What defines the costs and the lifetime? So let's take a look at the technical specification. So we have a decision about the material, it could be either steel, aluminium or even wood. Sometimes wood is quite good because if you have a lot of maritime atmosphere with a lot of salt in the air, a wood is more resistant uh, than steel or aluminium. Issues, maintenance requirements. Is it possible to do maintenance or is it quite costly and so on? This has to also be decided when you do the layout of the mounting structure. Corrosion resistant, so in a moist environment that is preferable for aluminium or galvanized steel. Uh, if you have a salty environment, as I already mentioned, a wood is a preferred choice. The preference uh, would be powder coated, but at least hot dip galvanized steel. Also quite important is a variable height and a variable mounting angle because you seldomly have a totally even surface where you mount the modules. Accuracy and tolerances could be not only by unevenness of the ground but unevenness of the module structure itself it's as if it's not really made in a proper way. Ease of installation, effort of disassembling is also an important issue so you may save some money for the structure but eventually you have to pay more for the installation cost because it takes more time. We see later a movie about a very efficient way of mounting module that saves a lot of time and money for the mounting system. Light current, carrying cables and sufficient grounding, integration of a cable layout, this depends really on the country. For example, in the United States, you have to carry all cables within a tube, a metallic tube. That's not necessary in Europe. Wind load depends on the locations, but you have to make sure that during the expected lifetime of 20 or nowadays more 30 years, the, the heaviest storm will do no damage on the structure. And uh, very important, the compatibility with the actual uh, PV modules used, basically in terms of size, but also in the positioning of screws and so on. Layout of the construction, a fixture of module and a module arrangement. So the wiring, how much wiring you need. Mounting structure should be able to neutralize likely unevenness of the ground, as I mentioned before, I don't know, point two three of four sorry uh, here are some examples of components for the mounting structure so we have here a number one uh, that's a fixation on the external edge of the module as you see here 
So you have to basically one input screw which fixes the module on the side. You have four, usually four such screws which fix the module. If you have a row of modules, uh, you can uh, use number two. So you need only one screw to fix two modules. At number three, the fixation between the module and transversal beam. And number four, the fixation of the ground pile. We see a photo of that. And as you see here with different holes, it's also adjustable. Here you see number four. It's adjustable in the tilt angle, but also in the twist angle. This is how it's been formerly made with concrete blocks made on site. This took a lot of time and was terribly expensive. A little bit more efficient are so-called gabions. So these are containers which are filled with rock, broken concrete or other material. So you don't have to wait until the concrete dries. You can immediately do the installation after you filled up these gabion foundations. Here you see also precast precast ballasts on the right side. So uh, you transport uh, the whole uh, ballasts there. So this saves you some uh, money and costs on site. This is how the pyramids have been made. So they made the blocks not on site. They made the uh, blocks relatively far away and transported then to the installation site. This is a more modern one with aluminum profiles, so either hammered or screwed in the ground. We see a short movie about this shortly. And these are the screws, the earth screws. They make it also very efficient to install. Sure, the material is more expensive, but you save a lot of money for installation, for installation time basically. Let's see whether the movie starts. Yes. Just half an hour by car from Bordeaux is one of the largest photovoltaic building sites in the world. The modern high-tech solar park extends over an area of 2.6 million square meters, the equivalent of 363 football pitches. Thanks to the maximum output of 300 megawatt peak, approximately 111,000 households can be effortlessly supplied with electricity. As a result, approximately 230,000 tons of CO2 are saved each year in comparison with a coal-fired power station. For this mammoth project, the Lower Bavarian family-run company Krinner took over the planning and realization of the foundations and installation. The specialist for ground screws will complete the solar park in just eight months of construction. The precise project preparation is the cornerstone for the rapid construction period. With help from special machinery developed by Krinner, time-consuming and cost-intensive risks can be calculated in advance. In the first step, the soil conditions are inspected to guarantee long-lasting stability and fastening of the foundations. In the second step, a GPS-controlled measuring robot creates a detailed site plan on which the markings for the ground screws are placed with millimeter precision. This allows precise and rapid positioning of the foundations and is the basis for the absolute adherence to delivery dates. The collected data is inspected and fully documented at the Krinner headquarters. The data is then transmitted directly to the on-site construction machinery via the Krinner Cloud. This means the foundation work can begin without delay and with the utmost precision. The ground screws are screwed into the soil with millimeter precision. The fully automated process and the special ground screw drivers developed by Krinner make it possible to position the ground screws rapidly. The material-optimized, patented design of the support frames adapts perfectly to the local conditions. As a result, Kenner can guarantee a high level of stability, low costs and rapid installation time. Finally, the photovoltaic panels are quickly and easily assembled with a plug-in system developed especially for this purpose. 
Thanks to cutting-edge technology and efficient working steps, more than 4 megawatt peak per installation team can be assembled each day. In addition, the support frames are completely maintenance-free after assembly, which means no subsequent costs. To us, top-rate performance does not just mean extraordinary quality and reliability, it also means extensive checks. For this reason, we check our products exhaustively before approval, providing you with the security you need. Especially in terms of the project costs, our customers benefit from rapid commissioning, freedom from maintenance and rapid amortization. 200,000 ground screws, 326 kilometers of support frames, almost 1 million photovoltaic panels with a solar park in Cestas. The inventor of the ground screws created one of the largest solar parks in the world in an incredibly quick construction period. Thanks to Krinner, quality made in Germany. Okay, here you see some examples for a roof mounting with substructures on the roof. On the right side, you see in order to reduce costs for the structure, which is defined by often by the wind loads, there are some aerodynamic constructions here that avoid too heavy wind loads. And therefore you can save some costs for the roof structure. In general, there are two possibilities for roof mounting. You either have a penetration of the roof, uh, which is which would be the simplest, but often uh, you have to deal uh, with penetration of water inside the roof structure. So not many uh, house owners want that. And so very often it's used uh, just ballast mounting on roofs. You also some, some ballast uh, mounting. Here you see conventional uh, roofs uh, with roof tiles. Here are so-called set profiles, which allow to fix the beams. And on the beams, uh, you mount the modules. This uh, set profile has the advantage that uh, no water can uh, penetrate uh, between the tiles because the tiles are overlapping the set profiles. Here are also the special tiles for inserting the cables. Here are frameless modules with some um, mounting clamps, as you saw before. Here is just a mounting clamp, which originally was only used for frameless modules. But nowadays, due to the faster installation time, they are also used for uh, modules with frames. Here the clamps, which you can put in between uh, two modules. So you fix two module uh, with a single clamp and a single screw. Here you see on the left part a fixed mounted module and on top of this round building a two axis tracking. If you remember the chapter with the irradiance, you remember that it's about 30 to a two axis tracking, it's even 40% more energy yield, but you have the additional costs in terms of substructure. your um, so-called mover. So also two axis tracking. The moment is a safety position because um, I took the pictures before a strong storm. And in order to uh, give a little attack area to the storm, uh, they are all now positioned in a horizontal position. This would be also the optimal position for a diffuse irradiance only. So you capture the whole sky hemisphere uh, during the periods of diffuse irradiance only. Here in the left part, you see the azimuth tracking. On the right part, uh, you see the tilt angle or um, elevation angle tracking. The costs of a PV plant, sure, you know, it depends on the PV modules. So this is also a um, big issue is the payment conditions, the warranty, interest rates. They are all different in different continents and different countries. The efficiency. Often the warranty is related to the efficiency and the power output. What is quite common is uh, that you get a warranty for 20 years that after 20 years, still 80% of the original power is, is reached. 
lifetime, formerly 20 years. Uh, now model manufacturers switch to 25 years or some of them even to 30 years. The model properties, uh, we talked a lot about this, about the electrical properties, mechanical properties and also terminal properties. Local conditions, the array orientation, the shading, please consider also the growth of trees. Sun elevation you know already and uh, we, we made also some exercises, some calculations for the lowest position in winter. Distance uh, between the module rows is also quite important. We also did an exercise on that. Snow and wind loads. So this is a uh, very location dependent. Some countries they don't have snow at all. So some really have uh, heavy snows. Snows also for wind uh, you have to also make a probability calculation of extremes. You calculate for 30 years of lifetime or even is sometimes you take a, a 100 years probability only for the extremes. Calculate the risk then. Soiling, this could be by dust, sand, clay, rust, or even could be some littering by people. Grid connection, this is an also an important cost factor the distance to the grid connection, the voltage and the maximum power. Eventually you have to buy another transformer, which additionally increases the cost. A site layout is the ground flat or are there hills and so on. The ground structure, is it, is it possible to hammer and to screw models or is it stony and you can do that evenness and also an issue is theft probability. The balance of systems costs is usually also defined as cost of per nominal power, also same as for the modules, a euro per watt peak. This peak stands for power under standard test conditions. And sure, it depends if you have a um, high efficiency module, the area of the module is smaller, so you can also decrease the balance of system costs. Substructure foundation, as I've been mentioning, depends on the material and so on, the manufacturer and the foundation necessary. Inverter and mounting. Wiring connection just depends also these are country specific codes to do the wiring as I mentioned already some countries require that you have a metallic a tube around the wires some is not you have to consider the ultraviolet radiation on the cables often uh, they are not totally UV resistant for the duration of 20 years. Diameter, if we calculated also the losses, if you choose a, to a small diameter, then you have losses in the cable. Also, the cable heats up and adds a terminal load to the cables. This may reduce a lifetime. So the engineering, procurement and construction, EPC. Is usually an engineering office which does all this. It's just first the engineering, then it looks for the cheapest or best supplier of the material and finally carries out the construction. There's a marching and profit. Usually when market is quite mature, uh, there are several players then, then uh, the margin and profits uh, go down. So uh, there are more co small competition and nowadays this profit margin in mature markets are quite low. Los Angeles is also considering uh, risks. So pre-financing, exchange rate, customs, sometimes there are delays customs, theft, insurances and commissioning. We can divide those Balance of systems cost in two categories or four categories. So first, uh, mechanical balance of systems cost is all um, mechanical parts of the installation, including substructure, module parts, and so on. Uh, labor work for the foundation as assembly, and the electrical BOS costs. So this is all the electrical components to connect and combine the PV modules, the strings, and we have the DC connection box where you usually find the fuses and the string diodes. Then the AC wiring, uh, the inverter connection, lightning protection, a monitoring system and the labor cost for assembling and installation and possibly also for maintenance. 
This is giving some examples. It's a bit old, uh, but still uh, it's quite usable. So you see the differences in the relative cost share. So you have here two ways. So this is PV module. GMS is for ground mounting structure and the BOS cost for ground mounting system, uh, for ground mounted system in light gray uh, here. And uh, this depends on the technology. If you have a high efficient technology like a crystalline a silicon, the share of the module is higher. If you have a thin film technology, TF silicon, then the modules are cheaper, but they are also uh, larger in area because they uh, have a lower efficiency. So you need more modules. And this increases the share here of balance of system costs. Here are more details. So you have here a share of the substructure, the cabling and wiring, the inverter, the monitoring, this EPC cost, as I mentioned, the margin, the mechanical installation and the electrical installation and other costs. Here you see two different types of installation. GMS, as I mentioned already, the ground mounting system. But these are roof mounted systems. So you have a pitched roof or a flat roof. If you have a flat roof, you cannot have the inclination of the roof. Usually in Germany, you have to incline it to 30 degrees. So you have additional substructure cost, which you clearly can see here. What is often in discussion is the so-called energy payback time. About 30 years ago, a lot of materials from space technology have been used because the first application of photovoltaics uh, has been space. There the costs have been enormous and also the energy requirement to manufacture super pure silicon and so on. And therefore the energy pay payback time has been really long. But nowadays this isn't a prob any problem anymore. Uh, as you see here, by paper which was published in 2016. So you have here for Germany, if you go to more sunny countries, it looks even better. And so you have here the worst case, a monocrystal in silicon. So you need most energy for that. In 2011, efficiency of 14.8%. So it's quite outdated. So usually if you're monocrystalline modules, you have at least 18% of conversion efficiency. But even that considering, uh, so you have a energy paper payback time of 3.2 years in total, including all components uh, here as uh, mentioned. And if you consider uh, the uh, lifetime of a PV system of nowadays 25 years, so this the very most of the time, the net um, value of the, the energy production is in the positive uh, range. If it's even more positive, if you consider a multi-crystalline silicon, which require less energy for manufacturing or thin film uh, technologies, which have been playing a role in 2011, 2013, but nowadays they don't play a role anymore. If you go to a more southern country, as I mentioned, it looks even better. So even the worst case, the monocrystalline modules uh, has an uh, energy payback time of below one, uh, two years. So 90% so of its lifetime, it's in the positive range. That's not even considering uh, the possible uh, recycling of the modules because the materials, they are still usable after 20 years, aluminium, the glass and so on. This is for Italy, Sicily now, so quite sunny and therefore the energy payback time is really short. Greenhouse gas emissions. So as you see here, even if you consider the worst case monocrystalline silicon with a quite bad conversion efficiency, 16.5%, as I told you nowadays, it's about 18%, you have an emission of 0.11 kilograms per kilowatt hour of, of generated electricity. To put this in relation, if you have a um, coal power plant, for example, lignite power plant, it's 1.125 kilograms per kilowatt hour. Even if with a very modern uh, hard coal power plant, it's in the vicinity of 800 to 900 grams uh, of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour, hour of uh, generated electricity. So photovoltaic is here really much better, even considering bad uh, parameters here. If you take a more modern one in the future, conversion efficiency of 26%, you are in the vicinity. How much is that? A 0.05 kilograms per 
kilowatt hour of generated electricity and so on here some some further uh, scenario you can download that uh, publication and see uh, which are related to it. but i wanted to show you this uh, just to see, say that yes solar energy can help to reduce climate change because the carbon emissions are really really smaller than a conventional fossil power plant depends also on the location so this is a different scenarios here this is marseille for example the first with quite a lot of irradiance and you see that the reduction of carbon dioxide depends also on the gray energy being applied during manufacturing and the related carbon dioxide emissions during manufacturing if you already have a very clean grid then then the gray energy needed for fabrication is also related with little carbon dioxide emissions if you have a dirty grid then the carbon dioxide emissions in average are higher because you have to overcome the initial co2 emissions during manufacturing do you see that in europe the grid is quite clean and therefore uh, you have also later if you do the total calculation uh, from the cradle to the grave of the module you have a uh, significant uh, lower carbon dioxide emissions per kilowatt hour rather if you for example uh, manufacture it in china because still the chinese install a lot of renewables but still coal is quite dominant and therefore each kilowatt hour consumed in china is related to a relatively high carbon dioxide emission you see the other locations here beijing the irradiance is lower therefore the carbon dioxide emissions is higher if you go to los angeles uh, here there the irradiance value 2144 kilowatt hour per square meter per year the yearly values is even higher than the one of marseille and therefore the carbon dioxide emissions are lower let's come to off-grid systems so off-grid systems actually have been the first photovoltaic systems. They have been applied first in satellites. Cost didn't matter so much because there were not a lot of options. There was not the possibility of a grid connection and so on. And these systems in the 50s and 60s have been terribly expensive. But even during that time, the upper picture in black and white is from the Times magazine of 1958. There was the expectation that the terrestrial application will, will increase. So it was, so there were a lot of applications, the uh, 70s and 80s in remote places. For example, on the lower picture on the right, we see a PV system in the Amazon, which was used for school there to power a video projector to, to teach children and so on and to make light. Let's call it PV 1.0. It was important uh, that the supply had to be far away from the electrical grid because it wasn't competitive at all to the grid. This is an, a picture of autonomous farm in the Black Forest from 1987. This is quite progressive because it already showed uh, integration of PV module into the roof it was cost efficient because the electrical grid connection would have cost half a million german mark during that time that's about 250,000 euros then the farmer decided to do a pv with a small backup diesel this became quite famous because this was during that time it was a quite large pv system and it was often in news magazines and so on so the farmer had a lot of visitors and um, tourists and finally uh, he opened up a coffee because there came so many visitors which uh, took a look at this uh, PV system and possibly he made more money with, with the coffee than at his farm work. This is a setup of a small PV system, an off-grid system, so-called a solar home system. So you have the PV generator on the left, then you have the charge controller in between you have a kind of a string a diet or let's call it blocking a diet that allows only that electricity can come out of the pv generator into the charge controller and not vice versa so it acts as, as a valve then as uh, a charge controller has a basic function to prevent uh, the battery from overcharging but also 
from under charging because at lead acid batteries if you have a deep discharge battery lifetime of the battery will be very limited so you have two thresholds this is for this example of 12 volt battery a 12 volt nominal voltage battery you see here if the voltage is below 11.5 volts multiplied here by a factor caused by the temperature so this is already temperature compensated and if the voltage is going, going below that threshold voltage the load will be switched off to prevent the battery from deep discharge on the other hand if you charge the battery and the voltage is above 14.5 volts the charge controller is separated from the battery to avoid overcharging so here are some examples so this is for um, basic electrification with dc loads so for example here you have a daily consumption of 400 watt hours per day photovoltaic panel of 125 watts under standard test conditions and if you allow a maximum discharge of 50 percent and two days of autonomy the battery capacity must be 135 ampere hours at 12 volt can also add an inverter uh, to that this is additional costs also do you decrease the the efficiency a little bit inverter usually nowadays have a conversion efficiency of above 90 percent if you use an inverter you should include that so you need a bigger uh, pv panel with a nominal power of 140 watts at a um, 50 percent depth of discharge the battery capacity must be 150 ampere hours at 12 volts here you see some examples on the right side of a uh, typical charge controllers they are quite simple one with only a uh, light diet symbolizing the the operation some have a uh, display uh, some here have a uh, display also whether uh, this is charging or uh, whether there is discharging and the state of charge of the battery these are the inverters just mentioned just these are special inverters for off-grid operation if you have an on-grid inverter uh, this inverter automatically synchronizes to the grid uh, while we don't have a grid there there is nothing to synchronize so they have to have their own 50 or 60 hertz oscillator and establishing their own power plant so the layout of a small pv system uh, with the inverter so you have here the loads e and you count up all the loads the time of use Oh, so you start with the end time of use minus the start time of use and divide it by the efficiency of the inverter then uh, you have the maximum depth of discharge for lithium-ion battery this is and can discharge 90 percent for um, lead acid battery it's highly recommended to discharge not deeper than 50 percent then you have to additionally think about uh, very cloudy days there is never no irradiance about little irradiance but you estimate it that in terms of days of autonomy so you say in germany it would have four days without any irradiance for the tropics two days are sufficient then here you have the energy size of the battery so the battery has to store the load times the days of autonomy so for example times two in the tropics divided by the maximum depth of discharge for example for lead acid batteries this would be division by 0 0.5 so in all together this gives a factor of four this example times the energy consumed by the load then we calculate the energy to be generated by photovoltaic so it's highly recommended in order to save costs for the systems to carry out energy efficiency measures before for example use light solving bulbs and you substitute your conventional light bulbs by led bulbs and then uh, you calculate the energy to be generated by pv so it's a load and then you have to consider the losses this consists here of the charge controller and of the battery 
Then for the layout, you take a daily irradiance at a typical day of the worst month of operation. This would be Germany, would be December. If you are in the Southern Hemisphere, this is June or July. And you take a typical day of that. And then you calculate the area of the PV generator. So you have here the area is the power produced by the PV panels divided by the irradiance received per square meter times the performance ratio times the efficiency under standard test conditions. You can also calculate the nominal power because usually you don't buy the PV modules by area, you buy it by nominal power and that is the area times the irradiance under standard test conditions. I hope you remember this 1000 watt per square meter and the efficiency under standard test conditions. So here, if you put in this number here, then uh, you can eliminate the efficiency issue. So you just have to have the uh, energy to be generated by PV, the irradiance under standard test conditions, uh, that's exactly 1000 watt per square meter, uh, the irradiance uh, received during a typical day of the first month times the typical performance ratio. So values depending whether it's tropics, while you have high ambient temperature and therefore also high operating temperature, therefore performance ratio is in the vicinity of 0 0.8. Uh, in Germany, usually a performance ratio is in the vicinity of 0 0.9. But this depends very much on the local conditions. Just if you remember the lecture when we discussed that on the PV modules and so on, the performance ratio. These are typical markets uh, for autonomous system. If we uh, start on the left side, here we see the cost of electricity in euro per kilowatt hour. And here on the top, we see a very high cost. These are costs from pocket calculators. These are battery costs from pocket calculator, wristwatch and so. These batteries are not expensive, but the amount of energy inside them is very small. So therefore, one kilowatt hour costs about 10,000 euro. And there, if you take a look, the yellow part and the orange part is the cost of equivalent photovoltaic system. So they are by far much cheaper. So it makes completely sense to buy a pocket calculator or a wristwatch with an included solar cell. Same applies for torch or electrical kettle fence. If you're hiking in summer in the Alps, you will see that most kettle fans now have a small PV panel because it's much cheaper than the battery. Then uh, you are even competitive with a gasoline generator of one kilowatt of power or a diesel generator of 10 kilowatt or even with a diesel generator of 100 kilowatt. Especially if you are the yellow part is for sunny areas a bit south of Germany. So you have here more irradiance for Germany. This is an, a yearly irradiance of 1000 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. The lower part is for 1800 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. And nowadays in sunny areas, uh, you are competitive with small consumer tariff. You knew this already. If you have grid connection, a photovoltaic electricity in Germany for large systems in the vicinity of four or five cents per kilowatt hour. So this is sure much cheaper than photovoltaic system, but all these autonomous systems include a battery. So include also backup battery. Therefore, these costs are more elevated and more in the vicinity of 50 cents. The costs you see here for 20 years. So during 20 years, you have only to buy one module. This is only 20% of the costs. But here you see the uh, largest share of the costs are the batteries. Even if you buy very good batteries, which last for 10 years, uh, you have to exchange them, uh, them one time. This amounts 51% of the total costs of the PV system. Also inverter usually have a lifetime of 10 years. Don't know why possibly to the electrolyte condensators there. I wonder why it's not uh, really make, uh, made that they last the same as long as the PV modules. It shouldn't be a technical problem. As long as the PV modules at least is the support structure, the installation and so on. And these are the costs then over 20 years. 
Some important points for the PV implementations are the irradiance. Sure, we talked a lot about that. The land, the safety or the security, the grid connection, the legislation of our grid feeding. Is it paid in local currency? Is the government stable? Because uh, even in Europe, uh, some governments decided later that they will stop grid feeding. And this was very bad for the investors. If you have a return of investment, perhaps after 10 years, usually it's not that long, seven years. But if the government decides after five years to stop the whole project, that is quite risky. So I mentioned already the power purchase agreement. This is, in other words, what I explained. So this is money you get uh, for your electricity being generated. And these have to be long-term contracts, uh, preferably inflation compensated. In the future, carbon trading will play a more important role. For some projects, the value of the avoided carbon is even more valuable than the generated electricity. The taxes or tax reduction, sometimes there are still subsidies interest rates, and as I mentioned already, inflation plays a big role. Equipment, the components have to be suitable for high operation temperatures, high sand and salt contents of air, UV stability is really a problem, and warranty. And warranty has to be given at a local dealer. It doesn't help you a lot if you have a warranty in China and you have to dismantle all your modules and ship them to China. This is usually almost as expensive as buying new ones. And independent testing. So you want to know whether the data sheet values are really reached, especially the power output. If you measure it, the manufacturer won't believe you. But if you have an independent testing institute that can do this for you and is accredited by the manufacturer or in, in general, this makes things more easy to make claims. Infrastructure. So importation in some countries can take an awful amount of time and costs. Transport to uh, the site, uh, this is also a considerable part. The mounting equipment, the accessibility of location of installation. Sometimes there's a rainy seasons and the roads are not passable. The installation team, the training of a local supervisor, maintenance. Also, you have to do um, someone to carry it out and he has to be financed. What happens if there's a problem? Who is responsible? So problem management has to be teached and about the future development. Sometimes if people receive that their system is good working, they buy more washing machines and so on and load will increase. And so you have to be prepared to extend your system. Also very important, sometimes more important than technical issues are non-technical issues of a PV implementation. So sometimes in many countries, short-term solutions are often preferred. So for politicians, even in Germany, a quick success is important. So they prefer very fast times of return. Often there's a focus on prestigious, centralized and large scale solutions, for example, nuclear power. So even if it's very expensive and the waste problems are not solved and so on, some politicians should like it because they feel more important if they open up a nuclear power plant rather than a solar power plant. There's also a deficit in education and competence in general, and PV in particular. So it's really important that everyone knows how cheap photovoltaic really is. Legislation. Often a subsidy is for diesel, but uh, not uh, for PV. Uh, this is also missing of update of uh, some ministries uh, because they are used if you want to make rural electrification, which is usually not a bad thing. But they are uh, told that uh, diesel is the solution to do and PV is not even considered. So if you install a diesel power plant in the middle of the Amazon, you get subsidies, but not for PV. Long-term financing. In many countries, uh, you still have a high interest rate. So if you have to do a financing when the, the return of investment is 10 years only, that's rather high in some countries. Many countries, they want, they have investors which want a return of investments within one or two years. And that's not feasible with photovoltaics. Missing marketing and lobbying. You have also to explain that there are also additional benefits. There is work. People can be educated at the PV power plants and also the environment is cleaner. And as I mentioned already, the carbon credits are there. 
PV costs are really transparent. You can make a satellite or aerial photography and show how many square kilometers or square meters are they covered with photovoltaic panels. So for example, if you have one square kilometer covered with photovoltaic, that's about 160 megawatts. Nowadays, this should be about 160 euro system price, plus minus 10% only. So this is a quite safe estimation. In some countries, it's a real disadvantage because by that you cannot deviate some money. So corruption is difficult with PV. If you have, for example, a nuclear power plant, it can cost sometimes 10 times as more as, as estimated in the beginning. So some people become rich in photovoltaic that it's not really possible. Let's come to the grid connection solution. Let's call it PV 2.0. This is due to the German energy feed-in legislation, which started in the year 2000. There they started to install 1.5 million systems, as we see on this graph. So these are systems up to 30 kilowatts, usually smaller in the vicinity of 10 kilowatts. You have the PV generator here. Uh, you have the DC connection box here. Then it goes down to the inverter. And then a uh, very important, the kilowatt hour for consumption and for grid feeding. In German, these are two different tariffs. Formerly, you got a lot uh, for photovoltaic grid feeding. In the year 2000, it was 56 euro cent per kilowatt hour, while the other counter for the consumption was only there about 20 euro cents per kilowatt hour during that time. And nowadays, it's vice versa. You only get 10 cents per kilowatt hour of generated PV electricity, while you pay about 30 cents per kilowatt hour of consumption of electricity from the grid. In some countries that's uh, different, uh, for example in Brazil there is a net metering legislation, so it's a one by one tariff, so you, you get exactly the amount you pay for consumption for your generated electricity. Important uh, for this phase was an effective uh, feed-in legislation. You see some nice examples here. These are houses in Freiburg, so-called plus energy houses. So these houses generate more electricity than they consume. This is a grid connected uh, PV system on the Munich airport with 2.2 megawatt under standard test conditions. So this is an 11 megawatt uh, PV power plant in Serpa in Portugal. This is a 67 megawatt power plant in Germany on an old airport. This is north of Berlin, also on an airport, 84 megawatt PV power plant. And this is a 100 megawatt power plant in China. It's a bit hard to see because virtually the whole horizon was covered with photovoltaic panel. as you see on the lower picture. This BOS is also related to some innovations, for example, automatic cleaning robots uh, to clean uh, the PV panels and so on. So it's not as simple as just making a substructure and so on. So there's even the possibility to do high tech at BOS. So we come now to the exercise. So first is to calculate an off-grid system. So we have here a household in Rio de Janeiro which has a typical daily irradiance during the worst month of the year, which is in June, July, because it's in the Southern Hemisphere, and it amounts to four kilowatt hour per square meter per day. For Germany, the irradiance at the worst month would be about 0 0.5 kilowatt hours per square meter per day. So this is quite good, almost 10 times as much as in Germany, or eight times as much as in Germany. And the energy needs, you have a ventilator, with a nominal power of 60 watts, which is operated from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. We have a five conventional light bulbs of 60 watts each, which operate from 7 p.m. until 11 p.m. As we mentioned already at the lecture, it's really important to consider energy saving options. We have a notebook computer of 30 watts, which operates from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. We have a TV set, quite modern TV set with LEDs of 100 watts, which operates from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. So first we have to calculate the load, respectively the daily consumption to be supplied. So we calculate then the battery size. 
Therefore, we have to consider the round trip efficiency of the battery, which is 0.8. The efficiency of the charge controller is 0.95. The inverter efficiency is 0.9. Then we will calculate the panel size. As you remember, you just you have to first uh, calculate the amount of PV to be generated with the local irradiance at the typical day of the first month. You can calculate the panel size or the nominal power. Here we take uh, an efficiency of 16% and which is quite normal today, not, not even very good, a performance ratio of 0.8. While it's Rio de Janeiro, temperatures are very high, so performance ratio is a bit lower than in Germany. Then uh, we calculate the costs. So we have um, initial costs with a big KE and specific energy costs with a small K during 20 years. And we have a yearly irradiance of 1,800 kilowatt hour per year per square meter. The costs uh, for 20 years for the PV panel, including duties, usually you get it cheaper, but while it's Brazil, the importation costs are really high. This is one euro per watt peak, but lifetime is not 20 years, it's even 25 years. The battery is uh, due to the high ambient temperature, lifetime is not very long, so we consider a lifetime of four years, and the cost of such a battery is 300 euro per kilowatt hour. And the mounting and support structure costs are 0.5 euro per watt peak, also lifetime for 25 years. So as I mentioned before, we just have to take a look at the existing load structure and we see that we have a light bulb of 60 watts each, which is completely outdated. If we substitute them by LED bulbs of 8 watts each, which has at least the same illuminance, we consume uh, per day, five times eight watts times four hours, 160 watt hours. With the with the incandescent light bulbs, it would be five times 60 watts times four hours, 1,200 watt hours. So that means 86.6 percent of energy saving. So that's your homework, and you get a video on the solutions. Thank you very much.